gave um, that you're going to hear about lots of cool technologies in machine learning and sort of the theoretical foundations, perhaps, of some machine learning. I'm going to talk more about the history and how biology has really inspired many of the deepest um, ideas in machine learning and how, going forward, I expect that to become even more important. So first, I'm going to just sort of give you a very brief definition of machine learning so we're not talking in the abstract. Um, machine learning is all about taking data, so in this case I'm calling it X, and some function, F, which I'll describe what those might be in a minute, um, and there's going to, that function is going to have parameters, W. And so typically X and W are you know, very large sets of numbers, and F might be very complicated, and we just want to find an algorithm such that uh, Y is approximately equal to this function, F of X, with parameters W. And what we're trying to do is find W to make this equation whole as best we can. And the choice of F and the choice of algorithm to find W is really the heart of machine learning. And when you say it this way, it sounds simple. And in some ways, it is simple. But making it work can be very hard. So for the well, um, some examples of this uh, might be that you have a linear function, like linear regression, in which case your algorithm is you know, least squares or matrix inversion. If you're talking about deep neural networks, um, that's a choice of F, and your algorithm is backpropagation. Or if you have a mixture model, maybe you're using expectation maximization. And finally, you have this you know, supervised and unsupervised. Again, I'm getting technical here. Um, if you don't understand this stuff, that's OK. Uh, all you really need to know is that machine learning is about finding parameters such that this function y is equal to f of x holds. So there's lots of applications of machine learning, and you're going to hear about tons of them today. But just to sort of so you show you how cool it is, I'll start with a couple um, recent papers that I like a lot. So you can use it for sort of artistic endeavors. In this case, they took a picture, um, this picture of uh, a canal and some buildings, and they restylized it based upon famous painters. So down here we have it in the style of Van Gogh's Starry Night and on the right in the style of the screen. Um, and that's just a machine learning algorithm that's taking some data, namely pictures by these famous painters, and another piece of data, a photo, and it's outputting why a stylistically converted photo. You can also use machine learning in business. And so you've heard of these you know, very large, successful companies. They're using machine learning all the time. And for them, they're taking consumer data, and they're trying to output some personalized ads or product suggestions so they can make money. And this, I think, is incredibly uh, practical and common, but it's just the tip of the iceberg for what you can do. As we get closer to the more science and engineering applications, you can imagine things like self-driving cars using machine learning. So here you have a car, and it's going to have a camera input. And your machine learning algorithm should uh, tell, you, tell the car how to turn the wheel so it doesn't crash. And in order to make this work, what you will probably end up doing is having many, many hours of camera uh, input and someone driving. And then you train the algorithm some function, which here is shown as this big, complicated diagram um, to turn the wheel. And then eventually, if you've trained your algorithm enough, done enough learning, uh, hopefully you have a car that cannot crash. So I'm a scientist, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about science engineering next. Um, and sort of the standard picture you have is how science or how machine learning enables science is that you take some data and then you run it through a big machine learning algorithm and that helps you get some new scientific discovery. And this is sort of the, the most common way machine learning is used in science. And I'm going to talk about it briefly and then I'm going to tell you that this is, I think, not the most exciting thing. Um, so for example, uh, you might start with some big data set like data from thousands of cancer tumors, including gene expression and clinical data from the hospital and um, demographic data and maybe uh, mutational data for what mutations that cancer has. You run it through, and this is like very hard to interpret. Um, you know, it's so much data, you can't make sense of it. I can't even visualize it very well. So you run it through some sort of complex data pipeline and machine learning algorithm. And you know, fundamentally, when people are doing this, these algorithms are kind of black boxes. We often don't know if they're guaranteed to work or why. We'd like to. But in the end, 
if you, you know, after some trial and error, the black box works the way you want it to, and you get some sort of interpretation of the data that gives you scientific knowledge. For example, in this cancer case, maybe you have some ideas of new cancer drugs or targets for cancer drugs that could help you uh, cure cancer. But what I really want to talk about is how scientific discovery inspires new machine learning. So this is a case of machine learning inspiring, or the previous example was machine learning inspiring scientific discovery, but it also goes the other way around. And uh, this is much more close to what I do. I try to understand science and how biology computes and use that to design new machine learning algorithms. And so the way this process really goes is you take some scientific discovery, maybe you're studying the brain, you build a mathematical model, and then you try to emulate that model on a computer to get a computer to work like the brain does. And I'm going to take you through some anecdotes of historical anecdotes that sort of gave rise to machine learning as we know it that follow this paradigm. So the first um, anecdote goes from action potentials to the perceptron. And the perceptron, as you'll see, is sort of the basic building block of deep neural networks. So back, you know, in the late 1800s, Emile Du Bois Raymond was a scientist in Germany, I believe, um, was measuring electrical signals in nerves. And he picked out these things called action potentials, which are these little blips here. Um, and what they are is they're the signals that your brain uses to convey information. And there's, you can think of them as zeros and ones. And, you know, you, you put a, a volt reader across a nerve and you'll see these blips. And they appear and they appear with different frequencies and maybe they appear when you touch something or when you're burned or some stimulus. Just a couple decades later, you know, a physicist was interested in trying to understand what type of mechanism can give rise to blips that we saw. Because we know that there's electrical activity in the brain or in the nervous system, but you know, physically what could be happening? So there was this model called the integrated fire model developed by Louise Lapic. And um, it's just a circuit. So if any of you are electrical engineers who have ever seen a circuit diagram, all this is is you have a voltmeter, a capacitor, a resistor, and a little switch. And you hook them all together with the right values, and you can actually recreate dynamics that look a lot like action potentials. And so what happened here is someone saw something in biology, and they said, OK, how can we model that mathematically? And they built this circuit model. Another few decades later, the cyberneticists were trying to build analog and computer-like systems that mimicked the brain. And they further abstracted this away. They said, you know what, we don't really care about the capacitors or the resistors. We just want something that has this sort of mathematical function where it's zero or one, and it can be programmable. And so they built this thing called a perceptron. And I'm not sure if this is easy to see or not, but you have these inputs x, and each input is multiplied by some weight w, so x1 times w1, x2 times w2, and all those inputs and weights are added up, and if they're above some threshold, it outputs one, if they're below some threshold, it outputs zero. And that's a, that is a basic unit of computation, and you can try to program it. How do you program it? You choose good values of w, exactly like the machine learning problem. In fact, this is one of the earliest cases of machine learning. What I think is incredibly fascinating is that back when Frank Rosenblatt was first um, building these things, he wasn't using a computer. He was using analog components and building large analog systems, um, you know, with hundreds of these perceptrons wired together physically. And he was actually building to do the things that we use machine learning to do now, namely vision. He was trying to build military vision systems to detect things. And he was building these out of wires. And they didn't work that well, but come around, you know, uh, 50 years later, we figured it out. So this is sort of the next story is how neural networks came to be, especially deep neural networks. And you can, we're going to go back to the late 1800s when people first discovered what a neuron was. So a neuron is the basic cell in your brain that fires action potentials I showed you on the last slide. Santiago Ramon y Cajal mapped the first neurons. This is actually a picture you see that he drew um, of a stained neuron in the late 1800s and was an early Nobel Prize winner for this. You can remember the perception I showed you. I'm now going to take that same complicated formula as you saw previously. Put them here. We have inputs and an activation and output. 
And people started saying, okay, how can we wire these like the networks of neurons we have? And you get these multi-layer perceptrons, which look a lot like deep neural networks we're going to hear a lot about today, um, where you just take a lot of these perceptrons with inputs and weighted outputs and wire them together. And so people started doing this in the 50s um, with physical perceptrons and more recently in deep learning. Um, where we now use computers to simulate perceptrons. And going back to my sort of definition of machine learning, we have this idea of y is equal to f of x. Well, f in this case, or let me go this way, x is our input layer. So these guys over here are data. Y is our output layer. These guys over here in red. F is the activation function. So this thing, what's inside each one of these neurons is sort of some function. Um, I described one previously that was zero or one. In modern days, we use these sigmoidal functions, but it's, they're basically the same thing. And also the topology of the network, so how this thing is wired together is part of F. And then W are the edge widths that we have to somehow program or learn. And the learning algorithm that in the 1980s was independently discovered a couple of times is called backpropagation, and is basically just taking the gradients of F. And it turns out, if we have the right set of the right wiring of this network, we can take a gradient or take the derivative of f and calculate w based upon data in an iterative way. And so what's really cool here is we started with a view of how neurons look in the brain, and then we took these sort of abstractions of neurons, these perceptrons, and wired them together in a way that looks like the neural networks we see in the brain are. And then doing some clever math and simplifications, it turns out we can write a computer algorithm that sort of emulates it. So this is exactly how deep learning sort of came to be. But an interesting question is, although deep learning sort of is inspired by how the brain works, does it actually work like the way the brain works? And the answer to that, I think, is very complicated. But in some cases, we know it's true that somehow, just by being inspired by how the brain works, deep learning ends up working like the brain. And an example of this, which I think is incredibly inspiring, is vision and convolutional neural networks. So again, we go back you know, 50 years, 70 years actually, um, and Hubel and Wiesel were two scientists who were studying vision, and they found these cells inside of a cat's brain that responded to certain shapes on a screen, no matter where those shapes were placed on the screen. So I could have a line, like this little line you see here, and I can move it around the screen, and it doesn't matter where the line is, the same cell always responds to lines at a certain angle. If I change the angle of the line, a different cell responds, or that response goes away. And so they called these things receptive fields. And it turns out that there's a mathematical sort of way to give rise to this type of response called a convolution. Um, and if you, any of you guys already you know, have a background in electrical engineering, or physics, or signal processing, you've maybe seen this formula. Um, I won't go into it in any more detail than that. And, and then someone in the eight, 1980, um, Funiko Fukushima, uh, figured out that you can actually build a neural network, or I think at this time he was probably calling it um, a multi-layer perceptron, that could do convolutions. And this is a diagram from his 1980s paper of the first convolutional network. And what's really amazing now is we take these convolutional networks, which are the workhorse for any machine learning vision application, and we can start analyzing what they're learning. And what you see is that they actually work a lot like the human brain. So if you put an input space, and you then analyze what the different layers of the network are doing, you'll find that the early layers are sort of looking for edges or circles and simple shapes. Then you get combinations of edges and more complex shapes. And finally, you get object models, so in this case, faces, because the network's been trained on faces. And this is exactly the same type of thing that Hubel and Wiesel found when they were sticking uh, electrodes into cat brains. Namely, that certain neurons responded to certain edges, and certain neurons responded to certain shapes. And as you go deeper, the level of representation is increasing. So just by being inspired by sort of how the brain works, we've actually recreated something that works a lot like the brain. I think that's a fantastic story. So in my own work, I don't actually, I'm not really a neuroscientist, I'm more of a biologist. And I'm really interested in thinking about how um, machine learning is related to cell and molecular biology. And so one, I think, in very interesting example 
um, comes straight from the basic physics. Um, you know, high, not high school physics maybe, but at least college physics. So many of you have probably heard of the idea of energy in physics. Uh, maybe you've heard that the negative gradients or derivative of the energy gives you a force, and forces cause things to move. Um, after, and that's from Newton, so that's from the 1500s. Um, in the 1800s, people came up with this idea of statistical physics. And what they're doing here is they're saying, okay, if we have a lot of particles together, how are they going to behave on average, or what is their distribution of behaviors? And this is also related to energy. And they found that the probability of some states that some object is behaving in a certain way when it's at equilibrium is proportional to the e to the negative of the energy of that state divided by Boltzmann constant times the temperature. But basically, it's just proportional to the negative exponent of energy. And this is sort of the Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution is sort of one of the major mathematical results from uh, statistical physics. And it has inspired machine learning. There's something called energy-based generative models where basically what we ask is we say, I'm going to give some energy function that has some parameters w, and I want to find those parameters w um, such that my data, which is described by this probability, this distribution over my data, matches this energy function. And what I think is incredibly fascinating about this is that using this interpretation, you can actually understand molecular yeah, nice, biology, nice. and particularly how molecules bind and interact with each other as sort of an instantiation of the machine learning problem. So if I have a piece of DNA, um, I can ask, OK, how do molecules bind to that DNA? And just to sort of review some biology really quick, DNA has all these bases, and they're sort of divided into genes. So a piece of DNA might be called a gene if that piece of DNA produces a protein or has some effect on your body that we can measure. And the way genes are turned on and off are typically by molecules binding to DNA, like transcription factors. So transcription factors are typically proteins that you know come in contact with some part of a gene and turn that gene on or off. And transcription factors combine cooperatively or competitively. And it turns out that because transcription factors in DNA are physical objects, physical molecules that are binding via physical interactions, they obey this statistical physics that the probability of some state of transcription factors is given by this equation. That means we can also use machine learning to try to detangle the complexity of looking at these transcription factor binding networks, something called combinatoric gene regulation. And we can also use machine learning to design new synthetic biological systems. Given some distribution of states that I want, I can try to find weights, energies, binding constants, such that my gene has the behavior I want to program it to have. Now, we can look at biology at a sort of higher level of abstraction. Before, in the previous slide, I was really thinking about individual molecules bumping and binding into each other. We might also look at networks of genes. So uh, for example, this is the genetic regulatory network of E. coli, which is a small little bacteria, one of the best studied organisms in science. And it turns out that you can model this network as a lot like we model neural networks, as this sort of mathematical function that we can understand through the lens of machine learning. I'm not going to go into the details of how to do that because it gets very technical, but I will sort of give you an example to kind of hopefully make my case. And that's that we can build synthetic DNA neural networks. So I can take pieces of DNA that I have synthesized, and I can use them to program a neural network um, in a test tube. And so this is some work that comes out of Caltech, and they programs a test tube computer where I put in pieces of DNA that represent sort of um, pixels of these sixes or sevens or other numbers. And this test tube computer can then classify, will give an answer out that says whether your input's a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, a six, a seven, or a zero. So it's doing a, a prototypical machine learning problem classification using strands of DNA as the computer. And I think this is really good evidence that you know, thinking about molecular interactions as neural networks and machine learning algorithms is not unrealistic. Not only can we use that as a way to design chemical computers, but maybe we can also use it as a way to analyze existing biological systems. Which sort of brings me to the title of my talk, that biological computation is machine learning. So what I've kind of told you so far is that if we look at molecular binding at sort of a single molecule level, DNA and the transcription factors that bind to it, for instance, or maybe proteins that bind to each other or other more complicated systems, 
Um, this is really just sort of some kind of fancy neural network when you think about it in a certain way. And we can go up a level and ask, what about these like big regulatory networks? All of these different genes as they all combine and talk to each other. Well, I also hope you can maybe imagine that these are also analyzable as sort of a neural network or a machine learning algorithm, maybe with a different function than the molecular binding networks and a different function than the deep networks you might hear about later today, but kind of conceptually very similar. And we can go up a level again and look at you know, networks of neurons or maybe the networks of bacteria in your microbiome. Those interactions are also, I think, especially in the networks of neurons case, very, very similar to the machine learning algorithms we build in silica. And at a higher level yet, we can look at physiological networks. So this is a picture of the brain connectome. So we're looking here not at individual neurons, but rather at sort of neurofibril bundles. And you can look at the connectivity as the brain also as the way we look at machine learning networks. And one story that I didn't put a full slide on, but is worth mentioning, is the idea of reinforcement learning, which talks about how the brain responds to dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that makes you feel good. It's very involved in addiction, but also in learning. And the way our brain responds to dopamine, at least in some areas, is very similar to this idea called reinforcement learning, which has been one of the workhorses of modern you know, machine learning breakthroughs like Google's AlphaGo, which you may have heard about. And finally, at the highest level, we have these human and social networks. And again, I didn't have a whole slide on this, but um, they're also interpretable as sort of machine learning algorithms. You can look at belief propagation networks and things like that and understand how humans communicate and how information spreads in the same way we understand machine learning. Now, for all of these, the question is what algorithms are underlying the computation? How are these networks learning and evolving? Well, in the case of molecular binding networks and single molecules in biology, that's probably genetic evolution and to some extent now human design when we design synthetic biological systems. When we go up a level and we look at genetic regulatory networks, there's something called epigenetics, um, which maybe some of you have heard about, and it's a good way to think about epigenetics. It's a way of programming genetic regulatory networks, say, in development. At the sort of higher level, yeah, groups of cells you might ask, you know, how is our brain learning? Well, that's via something called synaptic plasticity, which is really fundamentally based in biochemistry. At a more physiological level, you know, how do we learn, not just how do our nerves get stronger, but how do we actually learn things? Um, well, edu education and medicine and being healthy are really important there. And finally, when you look at networks of people and how they learn things in societies, we're really talking about laws, economics, and media. And all of these things, form one giant hierarchical network learning on many time scales. Molecular binding networks are working at the evolutionary time scale of you know, thousands or millions of years, while social and human networks are working over days or weeks in some cases, and you know, everywhere in between. You can learn a new thing um, in a matter of hours in your brain, or it can take you, you know, 10 years of study to say, get my PhD. So this sort of leads me to a perspective. Why does machine learning work? Well, um, you think about all of this sort of human and biological society as one giant network. There's been a bunch of research recently showing that large networks can be well approximated by smaller networks. And uh, the details for why that work, I think, are out of the scope of this talk. But it sort of gives you a sense that machine learning is taking a neural network and is trying to take a relatively small neural network to approximate a really, really huge biological neural network that's based all the way down to physics. And, um, and I think that's at least one interpretation. Um, and I think maybe you'll hear about some other interpretations later today. And finally, I might want to ask, what can biology still teach us? Um, so nature is this huge network that's integrating many different levels of sort of learning across different time scales. So as I said, you know, you have a physical level where molecules bind, you have another level where neurons are communicating, another level where people are communicating. Um, what can we learn from that? And it seems to work. Our society functions, you know, pretty well considering how complicated it is. And how can we learn from that? How can we engineer networks, take all these sub-networks and have them integrate together? I think that biology is really going to offer a lot of inspiration for allowing us to reuse 
the machine learning architectures we build and train once in new contexts and join different architectures and networks together to make larger, uh, more complete AI uh, views of the world. And so that's my presentation, and I hopefully can take some questions now. Uh, hi, this is Pratyush. Uh, I work in data science. Uh, so I have a question. So when you say that uh, all these different physical and biological uh, networks at different levels of abstraction can be modeled as machine learning, does it follow trivially from the fact that you know, networks are universal approximators or do you, uh, is there something more concrete about it? If you can just give an example for one level, that would be good. So I don't think it's trivial. Um, I think very little things in this field are trivial. Um, so to make this sort of more concrete, uh, so what a lot of the papers are doing when they try to take large networks and simplify them is they basically cut out different edges in this big network that don't seem to matter. And, and that allows you to take a very large network and compress it down. Um, and the reason you need a big network to begin with is, past, is complicated, maybe has to do with information theory. Um, and, but what we found, if you look at sort of in practice and you want to model things, is that even if something seems like it's very complicated underneath, it can often be represented by a fairly simple function. For instance, in a lot of genetic studies, people can basically ask, is a gene on or is it off? Make it Boolean. Although, in fact, genes are, you know, are producing proteins, and those proteins have different concentrations. So we've gone from a, a, a complicated representation, how, you know, how many proteins we have to just, is this gene expressing or not? And, and, you can, and as you start doing that over and over again at, in very large scale ways, um, you can go from an incredibly complicated picture to a much simpler picture. Does that kind of answer your question? Like, uh, get a sort of biased feature set, right? Then aren't you losing the um, predictive capability of your neural network in the first place? I mean, if you're deciding which edges to drop and all that, then you might as well just engineer your feature vectors from beforehand, like in older studies. Hey, could you say that one more time? Um, Sorry, it's just when I got a bunch of feedback because it's going through the microphone, both through WhatsApp and through um, here. Now, if you talk to me, <laughs> modern technology at its best, right? Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good question. Um, so when you're pruning things, you don't necessarily lose predictability or generalizability. You might just be pruning weights, edges that have, the weights don't really matter, they're very low, they're almost zero. So having, making that work sparse does not necessarily make them less powerful. And in fact, in many cases, sparser networks seem to be better at generalizing, uh, generalizing um, than non-sparse networks. I don't really know why that is, but that is an empirical observation. 